Tonight for our catechism class, I wanted to continue the precepts of the church. Tonight is on the precepts called the third and fourth commandments of the church to confess our sins at least once a year and to receive Holy Communion during the Easter time. I think the first one is rather simple, confess your sins once a year. You would think that would be a really easy one to do. A lot of people are afraid of confession. They put it off and put it off. Now you notice it, it doesn't have to be during Easter time. It's just that people who obviously are only going to go once in the entire year, since they also know they have to receive communion at the Easter time, they make it at the same time. Rather sad when you think about it with the great opportunity we have to grow in grace that the church has to make a law to remind you to go to confession once a year. Now, not everyone is obliged to go to confession once a year. Those are obliged to go once a year, obviously, who have the age of reason and have a serious sin to confess. Obviously, we all have sins from our past life that we could confess. It's very, very important for us to go to confession frequently. I think that many people that say they have a hard time going to confession is because they, when they were young, perhaps they had a bad experience and they never really understood the value of confession. When you go to confession, after you leave, your soul should be so full of joy. You should be walking on clouds, realizing that all these sins that we committed are taken away. How merciful the Lord is to us. How wonderful He is. I could have gone to hell for my sins, we should say to ourselves. I could have died and gone to hell, but He has rescued me, delivered me from that horrible place. And now my soul is clean once more. So do go to confession very often. Try to realize the great graces that you receive. Not only the forgiveness of sins, of course, but do you know every time you go to confession you receive the remission of some of the punishment due to those sins. And sometimes if you've made a very, very fervent confession, perhaps the remission of all punishment due to sin. But also, the graces you receive, there's a, besides sanctifying grace, which is given to our soul or restored to our soul or increased in our soul, there's also a sacramental grace that we receive from confession, which is the special help from God to avoid these sins in the future. And when somebody is struggling with a particular advice, and they keep falling back into it again and again, they have to go to confession frequently. I know that can be an embarrassment to you. You might say, but I don't want people to see me in confession every week. You know, Padre Pio went every day. And his confessor said, at when the good father died, he said that Padre Pio had never committed a serious sin in his life. He went to confession every day. I don't want you to do that. <laughs> you would drive the priest crazy. It would, it would, just, it would con- just totally consume us. But in Padre Pio, in a monastery where he had, you know, 50, 60 other priests to go to confession to, it would have been a lot easier. Obviously, he went to his confessor most of the time, but It would be a lot different in a monastery. Here, you can't go to confession every day. Just, just leave it at that. But you, I shouldn't say you can't, because actually you could. 
the, the fact is, is that confession is one of those sacraments along with the Holy Eucharist you could receive every single day. But again, the law of the church says go at least once a year. At least once in the year. You'd be a surprise how many people don't even do that. That they just put it off and put it off and they don't go. And so they don't do their Easter duty. And I have to remind them, you know, you have to confess that too. Because they'll tell me it's been, let's see, you know, I haven't gone to confession since, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it's been a very long time. And I'll say, at the end of their confession, I'll say, well, you remember now that you also didn't do your Easter duty. Oh, yes, that's right, Father, I didn't. I'll confess that too. You know, they don't think about it. You don't think about the fact is, is that you commit another mortal sin if you don't go to confession in the course of a year. Well, another reason that some people don't go to confession is because, and I think this is an excuse, they say that they're um, afraid because the priest will yell at them or whatever. They're afraid to go to confession. Again, maybe they had a bad experience as a youngster. I can't imagine a priest ever yelling at anyone, but I know it happens. I'm sure it does. But it just, I doubt it. I mean, I, I think what happens maybe is sometimes the person maybe went to confession when they were young to a priest who had a hard time hearing them because children often are very difficult to hear or understand and so maybe the priest raised his voice and said what'd you say? <laughs> you know and the, the person's like no everyone's gonna hear everyone in the whole church is gonna hear me hear my sins oh, that's maybe something like that happens but I, I so often have heard people make excuses that they don't want to go because of such and such reason that they're afraid or, or whatever. And you have to remember that the priest would have to die. He would have to die rather than ever repeat what you told him in confession. No matter what tortures he goes through. St. John, the Pomacene statue is right in the back of the church near the confessional. I guess the people who put it here in the church knew what they were doing. Because that priest died rather than to tell what he had heard in confession. You probably know the story, but the emperor, for whatever reason, was, I think he was just very jealous and he was always worried that his beautiful wife maybe was doing something bad. And she would go to confession so frequently that he thought all the more <laughs> that she's doing something bad. But actually, very rare in queens and empresses, she was a very saintly soul. And she, her confessor was St. John the Pomacene, and so <laughs> the emperor tried to bribe him, promising all kinds of riches and honors. Just tell me, what did my wife tell you in confession? St. John was shocked. He said, I'm never going to tell you that. I can't divulge what is said in confession. Well, after that, the emperor turned to threats. And actually, he actually had St. John the Pomacene put into prison. Not for that, but for some other reason. They, they had an argument about something, something else, and he had St. John thrown into a dungeon for no reason. But then he promised him, you'll get out if you just tell me what she said in confession. <laughs> no way. Well, he was in there for a while, and then finally the emperor took him out of prison and let him go. And then sometime later, he again was very jealous and wanted to find out, so he started to torture St. John the Pomacene. The tortures that he went through, it's just shocking. He would be, it's amazing that why would a Catholic emperor torture a priest? But that's what he did. And then 
he finally had him executed. And they threw the saint's body in the river. But amazingly, a light from heaven sh- shone down on the river and revealed the spot where his body had been, had been thrown. Because you know, when they, you know, they tie weights to the body and they drown it in the river, they're hoping that no one will find it forever. In our day, they even have to drag the rivers, you know, to pull up a body maybe, but they couldn't do that in those days. So this divine light shone down from heaven and revealed where his body was, and the people honored John the Pomacene as a martyr to the confessional. So you think of that, and you think of the fact that many other priests have done the same thing as St. John the Pomacene. That is, maybe not going to their death, but... They'd rather endure any suffering, any torments, any tortures. I've told you before, it's almost impossible for the priest to tell who you are anyway. Because most people just whisper, and everybody, you can tell, maybe it's a woman or a man, but I I sometimes can't even tell that. It's embarrassing when you get it wrong. (laughs) Well, it usually only happens with kids. But sometimes boys have high voices, so I'll say, now, I'll say something like, no, you be a good little girl, or you be a good girl now and obey your parents. I'm a boy! <laughs> oh, sorry. See, it's so you can tell that, you know, if, wow, if you make a mistake like that, you can't see the person, you can't even tell by their voice who it is. You shouldn't worry. Now, there are occasions, of course, because a person has a very distinctive voice, you can tell, but still it doesn't matter. The fact is, We're all poor sinners. Every priest that hears confessions knows that he's no better than that person on the other side of the confessional. It's Christ our Lord who's forgiving you your sins. And that's what you should always keep in mind. I'm confessing to our Lord. I'm not confessing to any man. So when a Protestant says to you, I'm not going to confess any sins to a man, you say, well, I agree with you totally. I wouldn't either. I'm confessing to our Lord Jesus Christ when I go to confession and the priest is there in his place. Our Lord is the one who forgives you your sins. Sometimes that people take that really to heart. I knew a girl, this was years and years ago, but she used to go to confession like that all the time and it would, it would practically make me cry because she would say things like, Dear Jesus, I am so sorry for this or that. She would be talking to our Lord. And she made such good confessions that way because she was understanding so well that this is our Lord that she was confessing her sins to, not to any man, but to Jesus Christ. And the priest there, as a vicar of Christ in his place, gives you absolution for all the sins you've confessed. And as I told you, our sins are taken away so that it was like we didn't even commit them. You should should be so full of joy after that. We should be able to say, you know, I could die now. I always remember this Canadian soldier, true story from World War II, a chaplain uh, in World War II told this story They were pinned down by the enemy gunfire and um, this Canadian soldier just crawled up to the priest. He was like, the priest said he was hiding behind a jeep, you know, you know, behind the wheel well and just the bullets were just flying. And this, this soldier crawls up to him and says, Father, hear my confession. And the priest says, right here? Now? Okay. So he puts his stole on and he hears the man's confession right there. And after that, a little while later, there was a call for a volunteer to go out basically in, you know, in enemy gunfire for a a mission. And the Canadian volunteered and the priest was, was right there with him and the Canadian soldier said, you know, Father, it wouldn't be a bad time for me to die right now. He was unafraid of death because he had made a good confession. That's the kind of faith that a Catholic should have. The realization that now, after a good confession, I can die a happy man. 
So take the opportunity to go to confession frequently. The church law, again, once a year, just once a year. And it's obligatory upon only those who have committed a mortal sin. So that would be most people, I would think, but unfortunately. But we all then should try to go to confession more frequently. At every, I think a Catholic generally should go to confession once a month. I think that's a good rule of thumb. We should go to confession about once a month. Because in that way you can, you can be sure that you are making your first Fridays, you're going to confession, you know, a week before, a week after, the first Friday or first Saturday, every single month, something like that, that you're getting to confession regularly. After, the real trick, though, I shouldn't use that word, it's not a trick, but the real difficulty after confession comes later on. The devil usually leaves you alone for a few days. I'm talking about someone who's, you know, addicted to a vice. Maybe someone who's addicted to anger. That's a big one, isn't it? They always blow their temper. They lose control. On others who are addicted to impurity, that's very common. Some who are addicted to drink, or some who are addicted to drugs, some who are addicted to sloth. Just to explain that last one, think about it. Slothfulness is perhaps one of the more common sins that we fall back into again and again. Or, because slothfulness concerns mostly our spiritual welfare. And a lot of times we get lazy and we don't pray. We don't go to Mass. We don't keep our resolutions from our confession or retreats. We end up falling back into our sins. And a lot of times it starts with slothfulness, just, just being lazy. Not doing, not doing what we know we're supposed to do, such as, let's say, a man who knows that he has to say his, his rosary every day. I, I've got to stay close to the Blessed Mother. If I do that, I know I'll be okay. I'll, I'll get over this vice. And he's good for a while, but then he just gets tired. He doesn't... He doesn't do it for a few days. And then he, he starts committing other sins. He starts falling back into, other, into vice. So, we have to, you know, consider a person who's having this kind of struggle. And maybe that's us. What we have to do is we have to be aware that the devil is going to come after us in a few days after our confession. Maybe even sooner. But that's where the real battle is. Because after you go to confession, usually on a spiritual high, you are stronger spiritually, you've made some good resolutions, and the devil doesn't like to lose, so he's not going to bother you at that moment. And he'll wait a couple of days. Then when he sees that you're getting irritated about something, maybe you and your spouse have a fight, a disagreement about something, and then the devil gets back in there and you know, starts whispering in your ear, you know, what's, what's the point? You know, why don't you just give in? Just give in and do this. This gives you pleasure. You enjoy this. You know, let's say again it was drink or it was sins of impurity or something. And the devil's telling them over and over again, just go back to it. That will give you some pleasure. Because after all, you're not getting any enjoyment from your spouse. And that's the way the devil goes after us. And that's when we have to really be on our guard. And that's why I always want to point out to you that it's at that time that you have to come to church, make a visit, go to Mass. Just get back to confession, perhaps even. And I told you in a recent sermon, too, that it's good for us to confess our temptations. You know, for instance, even if you didn't fall. Father, my last confession was six days ago. 
And I wanted to confess that I'm being terribly tempted to such and such a sin. I don't want to fall back, but I think I might have given partial consent. And so for those venial sins of giving impartially to it, and for my other sins, and you mentioned some other sins you might have, and that way, that way you're going to receive a special strength from that confession. Again, as I told you, the sacramental grace not to fall back into that vice. That's how confession is so powerful and so beneficial to us. Well, I better go on now with the next precept of the church. I'm taking all the time with confession, but the next precept is to go to Holy Communion during the Easter time. The Easter time is actually 14 weeks long. That's a long time for you to be able to get to communion, isn't it? And it doesn't even have to be on a Sunday. It could be any day during that whole 14-week period. As you know, the Easter time goes from the first Sunday of Lent to Trinity Sunday, inclusive. So, I think six weeks before Easter, eight weeks after Easter. Fourteen weeks. That's, um, again, a mercy of the church. I mean, the church could have made a law that everyone has to go to communion during the Easter week. <laughs> Boy, that would probably be a great burden on all the priests, you know, hearing confessions all that week. But the church gives us those, that entire time to, uh, to get to communion. Now, just what I was saying about confession is true of Holy Communion. This is the sacrament that's going to make us stronger and enable us to overcome our vice. St. Pius X said that one single communion should be enough to make us a saint. And he's right. He is absolutely right, because what you're receiving is the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. I always think of St. Catherine Labore. Maybe this isn't a very good illustration, but it works for me. <laughs> anyway, if you remember, one year, it was 1830, it had to be 1830, it was the Feast of St. Vincent de Paul, her, their, uh, the founder of their order. She was a daughter of charity. It was, the, it was his feast day. And she had a relic of his, and she swallowed the relic. And she did it out of devotion. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't like she, it wasn't like she was kissing it or something. Oops. <laughs> no, she had like, some, I don't know what it was, you know, but it was probably a cloth with maybe a stain of his blood on it or something. I don't know. But she put it in her mouth and swallowed it. She wanted to be somehow united to their founder to have the spirit of St. Vincent de Paul inside of her. Well, I would have said to little Catherine, I would have said, no, Catherine, don't do that. Because when you go to communion, you are receiving our Lord and His Spirit will come inside of you at that moment. But St. Catherine did it out of a great love and devotion and Our Lady appeared to her that night. Or I, I think it was that night. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was that very night that she did that. Our Blessed Mother appeared to her for the first time. So, well, don't go swallowing relics, but... Anyway, the uh, fact is, is that when you go to communion, if you had that kind of fervor like St. Catherine Labore and understood what it was you were receiving, I just, I just think we would die of joy. Just consider, what if it was, the Catholic Church was like the, the Jews? Like, uh, I mean, the, like the Old Testament, where... We, we could only, the high priest could only go into the Holy of Holies 
and even he could only go in once a year. What if that was the case? The Holy Eucharist is really truly a sacrament of the church, but only the Pope could receive it, and only once a year. It could have been like that. And you, if you think about that and how, how much veneration and how much love we would have for the Pope on that day especially that he went to receive Holy Communion because we would say God is inside of him right now. He received God. And until the Holy Eucharist is consumed and becomes part of him, that is, that the appearances of bread and wine disappear, God is in, in him as God was in the Blessed Virgin Mary after the Incarnation. And we would all venerate him. And when he came out of that holy place where he had received our Lord, everyone would be kneeling in front of him. And everyone would be saying, Please, Holy Father, bless me. For now you carry inside of you Christ himself. I tell you that because I think it helps you to realize what a privilege you have. What a tremendous gift and privilege you have of going to Holy Communion. It's not just the Pope. It's not just once a year. Every single Catholic in the state of grace can receive our Lord every single day if they wanted to. When you leave church with the Blessed Sacrament inside of you, or after you've gone to communion, people should kneel down in front of you. Just like the priest, when he walks by, you know, the priest carrying the Blessed Sacrament to a sick call. If there's an altar boy there, he's ringing the bell, and another altar server carrying a candle, and you would know to kneel down. At least I hope you would know to kneel down. You should. Our Lord is going right by you. You should kneel down. Well, the same thing is true when you receive communion. That's how much we should venerate the person who made that holy communion. St. Philip Neri, you know that famous story when there was a man who always left church right after communion. And St. Philip Neri found out about it and told the acolyte to go follow him. <laughs> Take your candles and go follow that man. The man's walking down the street and the acolytes are running up to him and holding their candles alongside of him and they won't leave. And so he returned to Father Neri and he said, what's going on, what is this? St. Philip said, well, I figured since you were carrying the Blessed Sacrament, you needed to have an acolyte accompany you. The man got the point. He said, okay, Father, I'll stay. I won't leave so soon after Mass. We should remember that, that God is inside of us those first, what, 15 minutes after you receive communion until the appearance of bread and wine are no longer there. First Holy Communion should be for us one of the greatest days of our lives if not perhaps the greatest day of our life. Always remember that French, a story of a French general who had all these awards. He went into his house and there was medals and certificates all over the wall, but the one that was right in the middle was a little certificate. And somebody, visitor, said, what's this one here, general? And he said, oh, that's my best one. That's the certificate of my first Holy Communion. It was right up there with all his other awards. And you see our kids as they grow up and they get awards for, you know, some, they've been on the honor roll or they get an award for sports or they get an award for, you know, some, some other thing. And they put them up on their walls, but why don't we have our first communion certificates up there? Why don't we frame those as a, an award, as a certificate of a memento the greatest day of my whole life. 
I always tell the children on their first communion day, you've heard me say it every year here, you're dressed like brides and grooms because today your soul is going to be wedded to Christ. You're going to be united to Him. And so they dress like little brides and little grooms. And First Communion Day, I think one of the kids asked me in class and they said, is there any time that we can go to Mass and gain a plenary indulgence just for going to Mass? I said, yeah, First Communion Day. You just assist at the First Communion ceremonies and you can gain a plenary indulgence under the usual conditions. That's how highly the Church regards First Holy Communion. And after you've made your First Holy Communion, well, the Church says then you're obliged to go to Communion every Easter time. Even if it's a difficulty for you, that is, even if you live far away, you can make the trip, make plans. Imagine someone who lives, let's say, in, I don't know, Medford. Medford's, what, three hours from here or so? Well, they actually could go to Mass in Klamath Falls, but you get the point. You get the idea of what I'm saying to you is that, you know, even if they had to go three hours away, you wouldn't say, oh, well, I can't make it. Too bad. No, you would say, I've got to go to communion at Easter time, so I'm going to make plans to do the drive up to Veneta. I'm going to go on, you know, this coming Saturday or something. I'm going to go up there and I'm going to get a hotel room and I'm going to stay so I can go to Mass, confession probably, and Mass and Holy Communion. So often we, we make other things so much more important. We say, oh, um, you know, we're going to be out of town. We've, you know, our kids have a soccer tournament. We're going to go away for a few days. Okay. But if we're willing to do that, if we're willing to drive three hours to go to a soccer tournament and stay overnight somewhere, why do we think it's so difficult to go to Mass? Why do we make such a fuss about it and act like, oh, uh, I can't make it, it's too far? Well, you should make it more than once a year, but the Church says at least once a year, go to Holy Communion. Receive Holy Communion at Easter time. Obviously, what we should do is go to Communion very often. Every week, and if not, if you're, if you're able, if you're able to, to go even every day. St. John Vianney, I think it was, who said, you can measure the devotion of a parish by the number of people who go to Holy Communion. In his day, obviously, they didn't go as often as they do nowadays. But I think his thought is, is still true that you can measure the devotion of a parish by the number of people that go to daily Mass. And you can't count the school children because they have to go. But you count, what I mean is you count the people in the parish who make that sacrifice. Those of you who go to Mass every day, receive our Lord every day, you're doing a wonderful apostolic work. You're setting a great example for your children. So many people grow up and they say, I'm going to go to Mass every day. I remember my mom did this, or my grandma did this, or my, my dad, or my uncle, whoever it was, they say, I remember he did it every day he would go to Mass in communion. And it's something that has a more of an effect on them than many sermons and, and the reception of the sacrament many times. What has such a tremendous effect on them is the remembrance that my dad, my mom, was a very devout Catholic, and they went to Mass every single day. I always tell the kids in school about a, a lady who I think is a very saintly woman. I might have told you in sermons about her too. She's elderly now, very old now. But when she was a young lady, she made great sacrifices to go to Mass every day. It was a resolution she made. 
even, and she was in nursing school, and so she would have to, in order to get to Mass, she would have to go on her lunch hour, and she'd have to take a bus because she did not have transportation otherwise. And she couldn't eat, as you know. In those days especially, I think that was before Pius XII's regulation. So she had to fast from midnight on. And that meant getting up and going to school, going to all her classes, and at lunchtime not eating her lunch, going to church to receive our Lord. And she would leave right after Mass, get back on a bus, and go back to school. And I said, when did you eat lunch? And she said, I ate on the bus going back to school. But a lot of times I was eating an apple as I was running the class because she would get back to school just in time to get to class. But I know God rewarded her greatly for that. As I said, she's a saintly woman, a very good soul and has done so much good for the church and the people that she's talked to and helped convert and helped change their lives and she set such a good example for her children and her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren now. So you try to remember that and be that kind of example to others in your family or in our parish. Many of you could go to communion every day if you only had a little more fervor, if only you made it more of a priority, if you said to yourself, okay, I've got to get up a little bit earlier, or well, I know or many of you, you're already off to work. I know some of you couldn't possibly do it. But I remember in one of our parishes that I was attached to for a while, the men of the parish said, Father, we want to go to communion every day, but we, we'd have to have Mass at 6 a.m., I said, okay. So we started at 6 o'clock in the morning Mass. And for a while it was, you know, there was a few men there every day, but you know men, most of them, they're not going to stick to something like that. And so it got to the point that, you know, there'd be nobody there. And you know how hard it is to get an altar boy there at 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Just start telling your you know, you parents who have altar servers, well, you know, Johnny has to serve at 6 a.m. this week. Oh, no, great. <laughs> but, you know, that was a real difficult thing, and it just it got to the point that, you know, we had to cancel it because the men stopped attending it. So the, the thing is that if we made more of an effort, you know, usually the priest would comply. You know, we would do what we could to have a, a Mass at a different time or... You know, we could, you know, even if we had enough people, have an evening Mass, so that would require a good number of people attending. The point is, though, that if we made a little bit more of an effort, we could probably get to Mass a lot more often than we do. Some of you have to admit, if you think about it, and remember when you moved here, you'd say to yourself, Oh, if I live near Venita, if we're able to move there, I'm going to go to Mass every day. <laughs> How long did that last? And what's funny is that now, many of you live five minutes from the church, and we, we act like it, we, we don't go any more often than we did when we lived an hour away from the church. You know, back when you lived in California, driving across Los Angeles, how long did that take to get to Mass? Remember? Remember the Los Angeles freeways and the traffic? Or if you're from another big city like the Bay Area in California or Chicago, God forbid you'd be from Chicago and you'd never get to Mass daily. Never! I just tell you, it's the worst traffic in the world. If you lived in Los Angeles and you thought the traffic was bad there, you should go to Chicago. <laughs> Spend a few days there. Oh my goodness. You would never get to Mass. It would just be like, forget it. I can't do this. So, you should consider yourself very blessed. You should thank God. I live five minutes from church, and if I step on it, four minutes. And if I make all the lights, three minutes. You, know, you should think about it, you should say, I could get there easily, and I could go to Mass every day, or at least 
maybe not Mass every day. I could go to communion maybe every day. You know, if you're a mom and you have your kids and you, I can't get to Mass, Father, I have to take care of all my kids. Well, maybe come to, come to communion every day. Do what you can. You get to church at 11.30 and the school children's Mass, communion's going on and you go up to communion. God knows that you, you've been preparing yourself all day long for that. You could go to communion as long as you're in the state of grace. So even though the church laws confess once a year, go to communion at Easter time, these precepts of the church should remind us of the privilege we have as Catholics. To have our sins wiped away, to be able to go to confession to Jesus Christ himself, and then to receive Holy Communion to enter, as it were, into the Holy of Holies, to have God come inside of us, to have God himself inside of you as he was in the Blessed Virgin Mary. That's what it is. That's what Holy Communion is. And if our Blessed Mother was so sanctified and holy, should not Holy Communion do the same for you? It should. If you are fervent, Holy Communion will do that to you. It is the surest, quickest way to heaven. Receive Holy Communion devoutly. There's no better way. St. Pius X said it. Many saints have said it. It is the best, easiest, quickest way to heaven is to receive Holy Communion devoutly. Let's make that resolution then. To go to Holy Communion as often as we can. At least now during Lent, say to yourself, I'm going to try during the rest of Lent to go to Mass as often as I can. And if you make a resolution so that you will do it. For instance, some of you could say, well, I can't make Mass on these days, such and such, but I can get to Mass on Wednesday and Friday, for instance. And you say, I'm going to go Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday for the rest of Lent. Do that. Make a good resolution so that you can receive our Lord more often and draw nearer to Him through the sacraments of penance Holy Communion.